This melon represents a man's head. Now, I've selected a watermelon. You might like to choose a gala or even a honeydew, dependent on your budget. But anyway, regardless of that, stand back whilst I let him have it. Took the top of his head off. For all the power of this newfangled French weapon, the fact is that Claude Duval never once fired his pistol in anger, which marks him out from the other famous highwaymen in history. Frankly, I never saw the point with my reputation, my savoir-faire and my good looks. Why should I need to shoot anybody? They should have been grateful to have been held up by me, the great Claude Duval, <laughs> n'est-ce pas? It is an honor. Allez. Allez, où? Highway robbery was all the rage in the 17th century. Crime rates in general were soaring, but when it came to highway hold-ups, they were all at it. You were lucky if you could walk a hundred yards from your own front door without being mugged at least once by some uncouth ruffian. But even so, with all this going on, there was only one highwayman who really caught the public's imagination. Claude Duval. He was French and flash, and his pockets were lined with cash. Claude was the real thing. Immaculately dressed in the latest fashions, he was both bold and charming, and he had the looks of a movie star. Men wanted to be him, and women just wanted him. Oh, stop, stop, please. You are embarrassing me, monsieur. It's all true, isn't it? Every world. Claude's hunting ground was on the Great Western Road, which is the equivalent of the M4 nowadays between London and Bristol. Although the road was actually littered with what would become the famous coaching houses, actually to see a coach on the road was a rare thing in the 1660s. Most people travelled by foot, or if they had a bit of money, they would travel on the back of a convoy of pack horses. Proper coaches with coachmen and fancy horses meant rich people, and given the fact that banks credit cards and checkbooks were all science fiction in Claude's day, it meant rich people with lots of money. Little wonder young Claude's heart was racing when his prey trotted into view. Stop sales. <laughs> Your money, monsieur. Claude held up the coach in his usual flamboyant manner and was about to depart with a lolly which the couple had stashed in a casket under the seat when, apparently, the man's wife took out a small flageolet, which is a bit like a flute, and started playing it. Duval was entranced. Ah, j'aime, mon ami, she has the face of an angel, the body of... Aphrodite, and when she put that thing to her lips, I thought my heart would pop. She was a bit of a looker then. I had no choice but to get mine out. Pardon? She played hers, I played mine, and then something beautiful happened. Encore. According to the story, and by all accounts it's true, when Duval played his own flageolet, the man's wife stepped down from the coach and started to dance with him. After a while, they were dancing all around the coach together. She was as light as a feather in my arms. You mean she could dance and play the flute at the same time? She most certainly could, and a lot more besides, if you get my drift. You didn't. No, not this time. 
After the dance, Duval returned both the wife and the casket to the astonished husband, but not before demanding one hundred pounds of it back. Monsieur. Ah, but... Perhaps one hundred pounds. But why not? With all that music and dancing, I felt it only reasonable to charge him for the performance. <laughs> Within a matter of days, this story, often many times embellished, went through the taverns of London like wildfire. While the menfolk were arguing over the details of his exploits, the quality of his pistols and the magnificent beast he rode, the women had other things to talk about. Not necessarily the size of his horse. Even little kids idolised him, copying his style of dress and incorporating him into their games. Claude's chivalry became the stuff of legend. Well, that's not strictly speaking true, is it? What's not true? What are you on about? Well, you know, all this chivalry bit. What about it? You weren't always so gallant, were you? What about the thing with the baby? Or oh, that? Claude once held up a coach which happened to be carrying a baby on board. Not only did the chivalrous Mr Duval rob all the adults, but he took the baby's dummy as well. But then that Gallic pride returned and Claude Duval gave it back. What can I say? I was having a bad day. The law was after me and I was, how you say, desperate. Well, that's no excuse. Still in a baby's dummy. You'll be ram raiding mother care next. I have absolutely no idea what you are talking about, mother care. What is this mother care? Forget it. I only wish I could. To be fair, the baby incident was the only blemish on Claude's otherwise gallant career, so let's not be too hard on him. I mean, without Claude Duval to set the standard, what would our image of the dandy high woman be? At a time when England was desperate for a bit of glamour, Claude provided it. With his Gallic savoir-faire and his genuine flair for gallantry, there's no wonder he became such a romantic legend. After years of Puritan austerity, Claude was a breath of fresh air who'd wafted in straight from the fashion houses of Paris and taken the country by storm. In 1670, Duval was the Beatles. Alas, like the heroes of many a legendary tale, Claude Duval's brilliant career was to be sweet, but sadly short. His fate was like so many others, the three-legged gibbet at Tyburn, which is now at the lonely place we call Marble Arch. Back then, it was the Wembley Stadium of London, with hundreds crowding in to get a better view. And it was a regular event. According to one observer, five or twenty a month would be taken there. Once the cart was drawn under the gibbet... The hangman would tie the ropes to the beams before whipping the horse away and leaving the condemned dangling. But death did not come quickly. The drop was too short to break the neck and family and friends were often on hand to pull the legs and therefore hasten the voyage to the afterlife. Duval's trip to Tyburn started with drink. You call this Chardonnay... I would not feed it to a cat. When he was arrested at the Hole in the Wall pub in Shandos Street, Claude was too at? drunk to stand, never mind deliver. Who is this? The James Tom man is drunk. Master Val, we're here to arrest you. Who are you? You have no style. You have nothing to do with me. They say Claude was carrying three pistols and a sword and it was said that if he'd been sober, it was possible that he could have killed no less than ten. Get your hands off of me! But he wasn't sober. He was legless. And within the hour, he was in Newgate Prison being charged with highway robbery. And that was just four days ago. Justice was swift in 17th century London. Arrested, charged, tried, convicted and hanged in four days. Claude just had enough time to write his final speech. Hey. 
Mon fans, these words I have written for you. And I'm quite sure that speech would have charmed the pants off the hangman himself. If Claude had ever had the chance to read it, but alas, the hangman was too quick for him. It's all right, I'll read that for you, Claude. I should be very ungrateful, which amongst persons of honour is a greater crime than that for which I die. Should I not acknowledge my obligation to you, fair English ladies, I could not have hoped that a person of my nation, birth, education and condition could have had so many powerful charms that you have not abandoned me in distress or in prison, that you have accompanied me to this place of death, of ignominious death. So, what you think? Not bad, eh? Not bad at all, Claude. You mean you really like it? You're not... Pulling Claude's plonker? No, I like it. Are you going to keep doing that? What? Well, popping up when you least expected like that. Pa! That man has no style. No style whatsoever. Don't forget that it's History Night on Prime this evening, starting with the brand new episode of Rome at nine. Stay here next, though, for Days That Shook the World.